Hello again. I am Chris Lee of Vandy Sports, joined by Joey Dwyer, also of Vandy Sports. We are here to talk about the Vanderbilt hire of Mark Byington from James Madison, which was eliminated by Duke in the NCAA tournament last night. We will get into that in just a minute. The podcast is part of the 440 Sports Network. Before we begin, our coaching search and basketball season is brought to you by our friends Stephen Andrews and others at the Wash House. Are you dreading laundry days? It's stealing time to do the things that you truly enjoy. Let the laundry professionals at the Wash House take care of that for you with two convenient locations in the greater Nashville area. Just drop off your dirty laundry and their professional tenants will give you back the one thing you can never have enough of. That's your time. Boy, that's the truth. Within 24 hours, you can pick up your nicely folded, fresh, clean laundry ready to be put away. Check out washhouseclean.com. Stop in today and get your time back. Um, our guest line on which Joey appears is brought to you by the P Murfreesboro Peer Milk Studio, which is presented by the Murfreesboro Peer Milk Company, a family-owned third-generation milk and ice cream distribution company located in Murfreesboro. A partnership began 50 years ago with Purity Dairy in Nashville to provide purity milk and ice cream to consumers in Middle Tennessee. They now um, serve to provide product to Southern Kentucky, Northern Alabama, Chattanooga, North Georgia. Today, they supply grocery stores, convenience stores, and others with purity products, as well as Mayfield, Nestle, haagen ice cream. Visit their website at npmci.com. Podcast also brought to you by Anchor Impact. Um where I stall before I bring up the read here in one of those days. Um, Vandy Nation, get closer than ever before, gain access to unmatched exclusive coverage, be part of the future of Vandy Athletics. Anchor Impact, of course, is Vandy's collective. We do a little bit of work with them. Anyway, they empower student athletes to success at Vandy. Help the Commodores thrive, contribute now. Visit anchorimpact.com. And get more information about how you can help out the folks who run Vanderbilt's Collective. All right, Joey Dwyer, your reaction to the Mark Byington hire? I got tipped off this morning. It is boy, it's been a circus of a ride. We'll get into some of that a little bit later. But first, the news at hand: Mark Byington has left James Madison or is leaving James Madison to take the Vandy job. What are your initial thoughts? Yeah, I think it was pretty unexpected that he were to take the job, but. I don't know that it's as bad of a hire as I think a lot of people have made it out to be. I think Byington's a bright guy, and his teams are going to, at the very least, be more exciting than Vanderbilt's been in the past. They're going to get up and down. They're going to really defend. They forced a lot of turnovers this past year, and I think they were tough to beat. They beat two Big Ten teams on the year 2-0 and against that league. Again, they got up and down. He let his guys make plays in space. They took shots early in the clock. I think my question with him is, obviously, the resume has only been a one tournament in 12 years, but also you have to look at it as – He's taken two really tough jobs, and JMU, I think, is really invested in athletics in recent memory, but Georgia Southern was a team that, in the two decades before he got the job, they had three 21 seasons. He had four in seven years, and then JMU obviously took that program to new heights to where it hadn't really been for a long time at least. I think Byington's a guy who you bet on the makeup of, and I think Vandy really has a chance to kind of strike before other teams. There's a reason he was in the West Virginia mix. And I think it was always going to have to be this way for Vanderbilt. They were never, unless it was Chris Mack, who I'm sure they had their concerns with, it was never going to be a guy who was a surefire hire. They were going to have to have a guy they believed in the makeup of. And I think they seem to really believe in Byington's makeup. They believe in his scheme. And I think Vanderbilt, if they're going to win the SEC, it's going to have to play the way that Byington wants to play. They're going to have to be aggressive. They're going to have to get up and down. They're going to have to shoot a lot of threes. They shot 22 a game this year, which – I think is what the blueprint's going to have to look like for Vanderbilt in this league, and they're going to have to be able to make them at a higher clip than they did this year. And I think, obviously, uh, with his teams, that's going to be an emphasis point. They're going to try to be disruptive on the defensive end. He said um, at some point that the turnovers are a big factor for them, and he said we're an aggressive team on both ends of the court. We're going to try to push the pace on offense, take the first shot we can, uh, but have the same IQ to know if it's a good one. On defense, we're going to be very active hopefully disturbing another team enough to get turnovers or get stops. And I think another thing with him is positionless basketball. And I think that could really be something that works in the SEC. You saw Alabama do it a lot this year. Um, he said, I think a lot of times you look at our teams and say, 
Uh, that's the true meaning of positionless basketball. I know a lot of people say it, but we actually did it. You'll see my center bring up the, the ball five or ten times in a game. You won't know who our point guard is. I think that's something that can be dangerous, but you kind of want multiplicity when you're playing that fast, and it feels like he really has it, and they have a team that can do a lot of things that Vanderbilt couldn't do this past year and couldn't do throughout a lot of the Stackhouse tenure. I think they're a much different team. They're going to have a much different identity, for better or worse, in the next couple of years. Yeah, I'm looking at James Madison's Ken Palm page. Uh, finished 62nd in Ken Palm. Of course, that that blowout to Duke um, gave it a little bit of hit. Did beat Wisconsin in the first round. I'm looking. James Madison was 12th in experience last year, and, and Ken Palm was experience raising ninth the year before, which is kind of unusual. And so I was like, well, is that he's bringing in senior transfers every year, or he is keeping some roster continuity and it seems to be the latter uh mm -hmm. which is hard to do this day and age terrence edwards was his top usage guy he's been at james madison for what four or five years tj mm -hmm. bickerstaff was behind that he was a transfer from boston college i think uh so he was in his first year in the program third guy noah friedel uh has been at james madison two years after transferring from south dakota state Julian Wooden, the fourth guy, uh, the website has crapped out on me. Let's see what we got now. Uh, he's been at James Madison five years. So there's something kind of interesting. He's been able to keep roster continuity with, with some experienced guys. Um, I'm, I'm guessing that was a selling point for Vanderbilt. I'm not reporting, but I know Look, th this constant turnover that Stack had, some of it is – just the day and age we live in in college basketball, but a lot of it was directly his fault too. I think you and I both know. So that's that's kind of interesting. There is maybe something to look for. Is he's a guy that's been able to keep and build cohesive rosters. Yeah, I think a lot of that has to do with James Madison's kind of infrastructure of their program. It feels like they've kind of invested in a little bit, bit more recently. But you also look at. Every time I talk to somebody about him, the first thing that they kind of mention is obviously the tempo. And they mention how hard his teams have played in recent memory. And I don't know if you get that buy-in if he's not a guy that the players like from all accounts. And obviously this is hard to kind of have your finger on from far away, but it feels like he's got buy-in from his guys and he's got guys that believe in him. Obviously their best player stayed for four years there and we'll see if he goes with him. Maybe that tells you something, but I think – Again, the culture there seems pretty strong, and I don't think you get to a 31 season without a strong culture. And it seems like they certainly had that this year. Uh, that was the most wins by a Sunbelt team, I think, ever. So great year out of them. Uh, I'm a little concerned about the full body of work, but a lot of the intangible signs and the makeup that you kind of look at with a coach, I think, are positive here. Yeah, and we are doing this podcast like, an hour after this broke, I'd gotten tipped off this morning that that was coming. So I, well, I, I would, I would say I've been doing a lot of research uh, and I've been doing some, but there's other things that come with it. Like just making sure that you've got the right guy. So I, in order to, I would, I would have been a little bit more prepared, but I'm, I'm looking because what I like to do is I like to say, okay, it's not just your record. What's it like to win at the place that you are. And let's go back to coach before. Mark Byington at James Madison was Lewis Rowe. I'm going to give you 2020 work and back to 2017 records nine and 21, two and 16 in the league, three and 11 in Ken Palm. Year before that, 14 and 19, six and 12, 285. 2018, 10 and 22, six and 12, 229 in Ken Palm. Year before that, 10 and 23, seven and 11, 223 in Ken Palm. And I'm going to see. Before that was Matt Brady, and looks like he actually won a little bit there, um, although it took him seven years to, to crack the top 100 in Kim Palm. He went 21 and 11 and took off after 2016. Don't, don't know what happened to, to Matt Brady, but that's not our, not our problem today. Um, so anyway, the, the, the context I'm giving, the last time they've been to an NCAA tournament was when? Let me see. While you're doing that, I'm going to look up Georgia Southern uh, because that's the place that he was before. Um, he left Georgia Southern in 2020. Um, Georgia Southern, 
hired a guy named Charlie Henry since him. Ken Palm is really glitchy today, so I apologize for this. Okay, Brian Berg took the job after him. Uh, first year goes 13 and 13, Kim Palm a 270, 13 and 16, Kim Palm a 253, 17 and 16, Ken Palm of 209. This year, um, it's not let me pull up the record. This is great podcasting, I know. I, I apologize for that, but we are we are getting you stuff as we can today. So um Georgia Southern this year went 13 and 13. I'm sorry, this year went. 9-24 and 24 in ranked 280 in Ken Palm. So let's go back to Byington's last year. They were 134 and went 20-13. and 13. So again, not a n- nothing that just pops off the page. But again, he was winning, um, gosh, he won 21 games his last three years at a place it's tough to win. Uh, did not crack one, top 100 in Ken Palm. But again, place it's been tough to win. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's part of it. Also, also got recruiting connections in the South and on the East Coast. I had a source this morning who was industry as well said he's got he's going to be able to recruit this area geographically pretty well because of connections. That's that's one person's opinion, but that was some of what was in the air this morning. The more I look at this and say, okay, it, it was not a resume that excites people um, in a lot of ways, which I get. Um, Statistically, I'm not seeing something that's obvious as, in terms of fit, but the, the coaching people uh, in that community seem to, to think highly of him. And besides that, you got a track record of guy clearly doing a lot better at the schools he's been at than the people before and after him. The thing I really like about the resume, and you mentioned it with the connections, he's been an assistant at Virginia Tech. He was – an assistant at College of Charleston for a long time under a highly regarded coach. He was the Dobo of Virginia. He knows his way around this area and this kind of region. Yeah. And I think the Power Five assistant experience is something I really look at as an indicator of future success for a Power Five head coach. And he has that, although it was only one year at each spot. I think those are jobs that are applicable. Maybe they're not the same as Vandy. I think there's very few jobs that are the same as Vandy. But I think he kind of gets gets what this region is about. And he also gets – Obviously, Virginia is a huge area with prep schools. You look at DeMath, Oak Hill, things of that sort. He's got to have some sort of connection there, you would think, and maybe Vandy can get back into those places. But it was interesting to me that he has the Power 5 experience. Uh, James Madison, by the way, last time they made the tournament was 2013, and then before that was 1994. So it's been a while, and he's taken tough jobs before, as you mentioned. So I think he knows what he's getting into here. I think he knows that this isn't going to be – a job that he's going to be able to take a, this team to a Sweet 16 in the first year. I think fans know that as well, but having a coach who understands that and kind of takes pride in being a rebuilder, I think is something that's valuable for Vandy at this stage. I think this is maybe the worst they've been from a player personnel side in, what, 10 years? Who knows? But it feels like there's a real rebuild here, and he's willing to do it, and he's willing to embrace that. Uh, we don't know that. We haven't talked to him, but based on the jobs he's had previously and some of the connections he's had, it feels like he's kind of a fit to take this program at this stage when it needs a new identity. He's a lot different from Stackhouse like most college coaches are, but for better or for worse, I think this program is going to have a new identity. And he ha- he knows, at least you would think he knows, that it has to have a different identity than what it's had in the past. Yeah, I'm going to read you. I grabbed as we were doing this their preview this year in Blue Ribbon, which you and I both know Chris Dorch well, consider him a good friend. Uh, If you're a college basketball junkie, you need to to pick up a copy of Blue Ribbon every year. Um, I'm doing the Vandy one this summer. so Yeah, (laughs) did Baron done that? Did Stack return your phone calls? Don't worry about it, Chris. No, I mean, did he? Did did, did you get – you didn't get quotes out of him when you did it last year, did you? Oh, I'm doing it this year. I didn't do it last year. Oh, okay. Got you. Okay. I – yeah, when last time I did it, I I couldn't couldn't get a <laughs> couldn't get a response. But anyway, um, yeah, uh, and I don't think he did it for the guy who did it. You know, it, now I think about it, it was a guy that did it. Somebody else. This is all neither here nor there. But that's that's promoting your program should be part of the job. Uh, another another reason that didn't work. But anyway, maybe a reason why Byington could do it. 
you look on YouTube and he's all over the place. Like he know he knows how to market that program from the looks of it. Yeah, and I don't think he's like he's a little bit more of a reserve guy. So that's mm-hmm. but people I mean, like some him. people could be yeah, some people could be a little introverted and still pull it off. But uh they were picked third in the Sun Belt, but I think what got me was um this quote, this is the intro in blue ribbon. Hang on a minute, I'm gonna I'm going to read this. Um, By any measure, James Madison's Sunbelt Conference debut was a rousing success. Mark Byington guided the Dukes to their first 21 seasons since 2016, lifting them inside the Ken Palm Top 100 for the first time since that same year and only the second occasion since 1997. James Madison landed in the top four in the conference standings for the second time in Byington's short term. The shiny Atlantic Union Bank Center remained a hot spot for students and fans as the Duke's exciting brand of basketball, 35th in adjusted tempo, 9th in offensive possession link, produced entertaining battles with familiar foes and new rivals. Considering that JMU's Ken Palm rating improved more than 145 spots over their previous five-year average, anyone can see which way the program is trending under Byington, who coached in the Sun Belt for six years at Georgia Southern. Nobody had to tell them how strong the league has become, 14th to 32 conferences in Ken Palm. So that, that was kind of an interesting intro and a little bit more reflective of what the industry thinks of him. Yeah, I think Chris Dorch just had a tweet that was telling, too. I think Chris Dorch knows the coaching community just about as well as anyone, and he tweeted, for all the Vandy fans who were concerned about the school potentially buy it, that, that the school might botch its coaching search, rest assured it did not. Byington will do a great job. It's a perfect match of coach and school. And obviously a lot of these tweets get thrown around every hire, but it does feel like maybe he's the guy that this program needs at this point. He's not yeah. Pat Kelsey. He's not Chris Mack. But I do think that they're going to have an identity as a program, and they've lacked that for a long time. I think Stack always kind of wanted it to be a defensive program, and their defense never reflected that. Now they're going to get up and down. They're going to have something they can hang their hat on. And when you hear him talk about kind of the staples of this program, he doesn't hesitate. It's pretty easy to hear like what he wants to build his program on. And I think that's exactly what they need at this point. And they need a guy who can, he doesn't have to be the guy who's out on the street selling tickets or standing on the cafeteria tables going to the students, but he's got to be a guy who can relate with the boosters and get them invested. And it feels like he can probably be the guy to do that. I don't think James Madison builds a roster like it built if he couldn't, if he couldn't be, kind of a salesman. It also feels like with his connections in the college basketball world that you kind of mentioned that your source is kind of brought up, he could probably build a pretty decent staff. And we've already heard some about the staff he could build and the early returns don't seem terrible on it. Yeah. Dorch was a guy that if I'd had time, I I would have called and picked his brain and and maybe at some point we'll have a pod with him on it or, or somebody, but yeah, I mean that that's a guy that we both really respect their opinion. Chris will tell it like it is. Um, so that there's that 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 answers the question I had. But look, I, I think th- there's a little bit of a split opinion on where they should go. Like I, I think there were guys out there that had higher upside uh, for the taking. Um, I would say Chris Mack fit that category. Mm-hmm. I would say that Bucky McMillan fit that category. Um, guys that I think there's pretty good upside with especially with McMillan and play a style of ball that would have worked um and Vanderbilt's always going to go a little bit more buttoned down so not a not a complete shock that it that it took that route but but that also doesn't mean it was bad hire I don't mean to to say that um but that was one thing like what's uh, are you looking for a guy that's just like big upside I feel like the program tried that once with Bryce Drew and that was a, a weird circumstance for reasons everybody knows, but maybe a little bit of aversion to, to that based on the way that went before. That's number one. Number two, I had said, look, you heard me talking in, in January and February. I think this program is so down that, that I could argue just bring in an older guy who has won some games, some places, just to get the program back on level footing. Uh, for a couple years, and, and then pass it off to the next guy. I was I was that skeptical about their ability to get the right guy. So I, I think Byington is more of a 
I don't know they're going to win an SEC under him, but I feel like the the floor for collapse um, is, isn't there like it was with the, with the guy we just covered. Yeah, I think this program just needed a new voice, Chris. They needed someone for to sure. get a different message across. They needed somebody to try something different than what they had been trying. And I think Byington does that. I was a little scared that they would kind of go not towards an NBA guy, but towards someone who had – maybe a similar mentality of Stack. And I think you don't want to completely go different from that because there were good aspects of Stack. They won some games in some years. But I think they needed something not entirely different, but pretty different than what they had. And I think they got it with Byington. For better or for worse, it's a lot different, and it's going to look a lot different in a lot of ways. But I don't know if that's necessarily a bad thing for this program. Turnover and uh, what's the other word? I forget. Uh, It's a big vocabulary word. I'm not going to use it. But – Turnover is not necessarily a bad thing here, and I think Vanderbilt's going to have a lot of it. It's The whole staff's going to turn over. I think a lot of the roster's going to turn over. It's a new era of Vanderbilt basketball in some ways. Yeah, I mean, circus was the word I thought you were going to use because I feel like that's what we just got done with. <laughs> uh, um, but anyway, there was a thought there, but I've lost it. Um while we're doing that, we, we did take a quick mailbag on the site. Uh, I think we've got several questions already. So I'm going to dive into that now. A reminder that our podcast, the mailbag, is brought to you by Sutherland and Belk, a family-owned injury law firm. If you or a loved one has been hurt in an accident, give Taylor or Russell a call, 615-846-6200. See what your rights are if they can help. Guest line, also presented by John Levin and the Maynard Nexus Government Contracts Group. Maynard Nexus advises government contractors on all aspects of their needs with a proud focus on matching legal solutions to business needs. Uh, I'm going to... I think I may just start going down in order here. SR Kane, do you think the current players, including those in the portal or a fit for Byington's play style. Could this be 10 new faces, or will he retain some guys? On another note, I do think this system is a great fit for the incoming freshman. You want to take that first, or you want me to go? I, I don't have a good answer. I mean, I, I would think that maybe Jason Rivera-Torres might be an easier sell for a coach like this, but who knows? Mm-hmm. I think it's a system that guys are probably going to want to play in, and that was what I was concerned about with – some other coaches, I think Mitch Henderson in particular, I think his offense is brilliant. But I don't know that guys would want to play in that and play the Princeton in the SEC. Can you get SEC caliber guys to want to play in that? I don't know. I think guys want to play in an up-and-down tempo. Now they're going to have to defend, and I think that's going to be something that they're going to have to put an emphasis point on. Maybe they're not going to be a top-five defensive team in the league every year, but they're going to have to really get after it like James Madison has done the last two years. But – I think there's a real selling point to that style of play when you're going up and down. Everybody's getting theirs. Uh, let's see how many double-digit scores they had. They had three, and then they had a couple other guys dang near close to it and a couple other guys closer to seven. They're going to get a lot of shots up, and they're going to take good ones. But I think as a as a whole, it's probably a system that guys want to play in. Speaking to guys individually, Rivera Torres is the one that came to my mind. If they can get him to buy in defensively, I think he could be a great fit with this. I don't know if it's going to look quite like Alabama, but it's going to have some shades of what they do. Mm, yeah. Um, th- th- by the way, I'm glad you, Nate Oates got dropped is a name that might be a little comparable. And he didn't have as much success as Oates did as, as quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, but that, that name was dropped to me this morning by somebody in the coaching community is, is a yeah. ish comp. Right. But again, just looking at like their roster, I mean, I don't know if you want to keep that whole roster, but I think there are guys who could be better in that than what they did this year. There's going to be a lot more free-flowing in this offense, I think. Now I need to look at actually what they're running as opposed to just kind of a broad overview. We didn't have time to really dive into that. We might go do some things tonight, and maybe we'll look at that again. But I do think it's going to be a little bit more appealing to play in than the 250 set plays. We're going to slow it down. We're going to (laughs) run a set and – do all this and that we're going to hang our hat on defense guys don't really want to play in that they wanted to play the only reason that that would be something worth playing is because of how highly regarded stack was nationally for the stuff he ran i think even 
then that was a little overblown at times. I think yeah. at some point that's a disadvantage to where you're running all those sets every time and your guys aren't playing freely. So to not go individually, maybe we'll go individually later, but I do think that it's going to be slightly more appealing than what they've had in the past and maybe even more organized than like what Bryce Drew ran. I need to look more into what they're actually running again, though. Okay, baseball bros, when did you first know it's going to be Byington and what were your initial reactions? I found out this morning that name got dropped to me, you know, a few days ago. Um, keep an eye on. I think everybody thought, you know, the, the roller coaster everybody took people through was, you know, bunch of different names and and, and Byington kind of came up late as a leader. But I, I did have somebody say something interesting to me last night when Danny Sprinkle was kind of the hot name. He said to me, you know, if I'm betting between Sprinkle and Byington, and this is before Byington was really front and center with this, he said, I'm I'm going to bet on Byington because Sprinkle is all west, west coast, and, and Byington is east coast. And, and east of the Mississippi kind of matters in this industry, and, and that was – that, that might have been a good tip-off. Yeah, I think Sprinkle is probably a flashier name. I think he got a better job than Byington did. I think Byington may be a better fit for this job in particular. I think Sprink I would probably rather hire Sprinkle if we're on an even playing field, but for this job in particular, I mean Sprinkle didn't have the power five assistant experience, if I remember correctly. A lot of it's the West Coast. Um, and I don't know that they're that dissimilar. I think they are they are different in some ways, but I do think Byington, I think, is someone who fits this job a little bit better than Sprinkle did. And Sprinkle would be a name that people liked a lot more, but maybe that's not the direction they needed to head in as same with Kyle Smith to where like, he's a good coach. He's got some great national traction. He's a better fit for Stanford than he is for Vandy by a long shot. Okay. Baseball bros has got the next three or four. Um, was this as much of a roller coaster as it seemed or more Vanderbilt just keeping everything a hush hush? I would answer it this way. Vanderbilt is always a search where, there's about four or five people on the inside that really know what's going on. And so it's always going to be tough to get info on that end. You've got to be really well connected on the other side of things. Uh, and fortunately, I've been able to, to kind of build up several connections there over the years. And so I think that the, I mean, it, it wasn't like Byington's name never popped up, right? It was kind of later in the process. I, I will give you some context here that I that I learned today. I haven't even dropped this on the board yet. Um, but what I was told was that they felt they had a really good shot at Dusty May. Really good shot. And and from what I'm hearing, they really did. Uh, it was a three-team race between Michigan, Louisville, and Vanderbilt. And for what I've, I've been heard multiple places, perception is Vanderbilt finished second. And, you know, maybe, I don't know. One criticism I had, I, I thought they should have parted with Stack earlier to get a jump on this. I don't know that would have made a difference if you could have gotten out in front of Michigan. Could you have sealed a deal there? I don't know. And at the end of the day, Michigan's a bigger job than Vanderbilt. Nobody really blames Mark, or I don't think anybody really blames Vanderbilt for failure to close on this kind of a job over Michigan. I, I certainly don't. Um, yeah. but, but they got really close, and I think that was the one thing. There was a lot of Chris Mack stuff out there. He wanted the job pretty badly from what I'm told. I don't think he was looking to get in uh, back in the industry. Um, you know, and his daughter's at Vandy, so I don't know how much of that is he wants a job and he wants Vanderbilt. But that he was there for the taking. I think Bucky McMillan would have been theirs for the taking too. So it was a – it was it was a good environment for them. They were very fortunate to have an opening or make an opening at a good time. That's number one. But I think all along they were kind of under the radar on dust on uh, under the radar on Dusty May. I'd heard that mentioned. I got a tip Friday afternoon that hey, this is a bigger thing than people perceive. Um, and, and then he takes Michigan. Saturday night, I think that set off. Oh, I don't know how to term what came next because I don't know all the facts. But a, uh, you know, the the dominoes to get the next guy, I guess, is a good way to put it. Danny Sprinkle is the name that was out there. 
Uh, Sunday night, I think they were very involved with him. But again, I think he was always – he was inclined to take Washington to begin with, from what I'd been told. Mm-hmm. And then they didn't have an AD, which was a – you know, that was a wild card because it's hard to go work if you don't know who your boss is going to be. But he's from Washington. He went ahead and took it anyway. And so maybe that explains – um why they got to Byington that quickly, or maybe it was just the fact that he was playing basketball late last night and, and, and now he's not. So that's, I don't know how much that answers the question, but that's, that's my thought on it from the inside and the stuff I was getting. Yeah. I, you know, a lot more than I do about the intricacies of it. It didn't seem like as bad of a search as it could have been though. I think they did a decent job kind of vetting things out and, Obviously, the Dusty May thing tells you a lot that they were being aggressive and that they were looking for the right things. And that almost gives me confidence that Byington will be better than maybe some people anticipate is because maybe they've compared him to Dusty May in some ways. Maybe the blueprint was somewhat similar. And we still have to learn more about each candidate to kind of get there. But it does seem like this was a better ran search than maybe you would have thought originally. Yeah, I've got people that are that are on both sides of that, I tend to believe they did a pretty good job. Um, what I wanted to see from them was identify good candidates and go after them. Uh, mm-hmm. Now, I, I do I do think the one, the, the two criticisms I have, um, I'll keep one of them to myself. I still think that they are, they, they draw unnecessary um qualifications that have nothing to do with the job. In other words, um, I, I think if they're choosing between a Pat Kelsey or a, a Mark Byington, they're going to take the guy that's less out there, more buttoned down. And this is a time where the program needs some excitement. I'm not saying he can't provide it. They Look, they win and nobody's going to care. Bill Snyder was as boring as you can get and won a lot of football games at Kansas State. So if you win, this isn't going to matter. But that's one of my one of my criticisms is I feel like there was some of that out there, and I'm like, that's that's not that that shouldn't be a criteria. Now, I think what that is is we want to have our way of doing stuff, and we don't want to be pushed around by by somebody the way James Franklin did it. That's that's my read on it. Um, I, I'm sure that's part of it, but uh, other that that stuff aside, I think they identified good candidates. You cannot judge them for going after Dusty May and getting that close, because here's what would have happened. If Dusty May was a realistic person and they throw in the towel and they say, well, we just can't get him. People are going to go bananas and say, well, you didn't, you didn't take a try at Dusty May. Mm -hmm. Um, I I still don't know what to think of Chris Mack, to be honest with you. I don't know if that would, I I know people that most people seem to think that they made a better move taking Byington Really? Than, than taking Chris Mack. But you and I both, we, we know people that, that swear by the guy. The, the, the Louisville thing, I always thought, well, I shouldn't say that. People told me, said, hey, look, if you're taking that to HR, um, good, good luck getting that through Vanderbilt with the way that ended at Louisville. And, and, and that may have been completely fair. I, I don't know. That was such a mess. Louisville's kind of a mess right now in the, in the sense that Vanderbilt's been. There was a huge mess back then, too. Right. And so I don't, know, I don't know what's fair coaches, to judge. Right? What's that? Didn't they have three interim coaches at one time or something along those lines oh, back who then? Who knows? Who knows? But point, point being, I, I don't really know what to make of that. I mean, the bottom line is he did win in 10 years at Xavier. He went to the NCAA tournament nine times. Mm-hmm. And when it out, I usually fall back on the record, but it was an interesting case. Um, you know, again, I, I think they should have been a little more aggressive with Bucky McMillan. I think there's a little bit of an industry bias against him that he's gimmicky. I don't mm-hmm. know if that's fair. I think the guy's smart enough to adapt to different things, but who knows? Um, but on, on the whole, look, you wanted them to go after good coaches. Um who who are plausible guys that can do things at Vanderbilt? And I think was he the best guy? I don't know. Could they have done a lot worse? They usually do. Yeah, I think they they definitely did better than I think maybe we had thought heading in, and the result was probably semi similar to what we thought it would be in terms of the pool they were sitting in. May would have been 
something else. I don't know if this is a complete home run, but I think you can definitely talk yourself into this being a hire that can get this thing back on the right track at the very least. Yeah. I think that's really what you're looking for at this point. Like you don't, I don't know that this is a home run, like I said, but I think they're trending towards being a team that could head in the right direction this season and can play really hard. And that's what you're asking in year one. I would kind of give it a B, Mm -hmm. but they they could make it. They could make this a B plus or an A minus by busting their tails and and really helping this guy in NIL getting him out there in front of people, making relationships with boosters and fans, getting people back in the gym. This is the thing where like if Vanderbilt screws the pooch again, then then it's gonna it's gonna drag whoever takes this job down. Mm-hmm. Or if if they get aggressive and be smart and you got people doing stuff behind the scenes to help the guy out and promoting him and, and selling him as a human being. You know, this this whole nonsense that Jerry Stackhouse threw at us five years after the fact and nobody got to know me, that was, that was such garbage. And I, and and I fought the school for that. The school should have stepped up early and said, Hey man, this isn't how you do it as a coach. And instead they sat there and let that whole thing simmer for five years. And that's where the program is. They cannot make that same mistake this time. Yeah. They got to support him. And that, yeah, this isn't an impossible job. But Vanderbilt can make it dang near an impossible job if it doesn't do the right things around yes. by. Him. If they yeah. can, if they can get him in front of boosters and they can get some NIL help, help for him, that makes him look a heck of a lot better uh, as a recruiter than you would have thought that he looked. And yeah. he can market this program into something that it hasn't been marketed as for the last few years, and you could fill the gym once in a while. I think that helps him immensely, and it wouldn't have helped him or it doesn't help him if they do the opposite. He shouldn't be fighting an uphill battle here. I think other coaches, like Shea Ralph has mentioned a lot of the time that she's felt like she's been very supported. And I don't know that every Vanderbilt coach has kind of been that way. So if they can do that for him, I think they could be in a really good spot infrastructure-wise. Baseball bros, can you confirm with certainty he was actually interviewed for the position? I can can confirm Mark Byington interviewed. (laughs) Yeah, Um, I guess so. I well look, I mean, what's an interview? What's contact? I don't Casey Alexander did interview. Chris Mack obviously did interview. Um, they had some contact with Sprinkle for sure. I think uh Josh Schertz, I believe, was in the mix. Um I've heard I've heard various things on Bucky McMillan. I think they had some contact there. I'm not one hundred percent sure of it. Um, but I think there was there was something uh, I feel like I'm Kyle Smith has been yeah. mentioned with them even before there was a vacancy. Mm-hmm. Uh, w- what is, what is agents doing this and that? And what was real? You, you don't always know. We'll, we'll probably find out more one day, but that's off the top of my head. What I can think of. Yeah. And I, and I think, I think, I think they really wanted a shot at Amir Abdul Rahim. I just don't have a lot of evidence that he was really listening. Yeah, he would have been a really good hire, and I think he would have fit what they wanted, but I just don't think that – again, we never had any any indication he was interested. I don't have much more on interviews than that. I think you hit all of it. Will you try to get him on your podcast? Absolutely. Um, I, have, I hope for what our access will look like under him, based on what I've yeah. seen with JMU. Yeah. Are any of his current uh, – from GoDoors94, are any of his current players candidates to come to Vanderbilt? Um, I have not done any sort of a, a dive on that. I think, didn't you mention somebody off the top here? Yeah, Terrence Edwards is their best player ever, 17 a game on 42% shooting. And he played at JMU for four years. Looks like he has one year of eligibility left. So that would be a guy that they could get as a grad transfer, presumably. And that would yeah. be a huge get for them. Like that would be probably their best player next year, regardless of who comes back. Bickerstaff, I'm not sure. He's a two-time transfer. Maybe he's he's going to grad transfer. It looks like he's already played five years, so he's probably done. Uh, Frito, I would guess, is probably done. Let's see. He's played five years. Um, I don't know. They have Jalen Carey, who's their their highly regarded freshman big. It's a, Whether Byington thinks he can play at this level, I think, is not decided yet. But that's a guy they could presumably get here, 6'8 forward. Um from the southeast so we'll see 
their point guard was a two-time transfer. Let me see one more name. Julian Wooden looks like he's done. He's got, he's played five years there. So a lot of his guys are really old and I think it's going to be tough for him to bring everybody back, but Edwards, I'm not sure how possible it is to bring him back, but presumably he'd have another year of eligibility and that would be a great starting point for them. And Arbador, give us two or three reasons each why this hire might work out and then why it won. I'll let you start with why. Why it would work is because they needed a change of direction and a change of identity. And now they have an identity. They're going to get up and down. They're probably going to play really hard based on what he said before. He's not like a Micah Shrewsbury where he's going to go in the post game and get on his guys because they didn't play super hard. But you would think that they're going to have an identity of some sort. And I think the personality and the the makeup is something you bet on. And I think they bet on that maybe a little even more than the resume. I also love the power five assistant experience concerns as to why it won't work out. I mean, he's not, I don't think it's a home run just because he's not some of the other candidates and the tournament track record hasn't quite been there yet. And he hasn't coached at a power five school as a head guy. So there's always obviously something there. Um, trying to think of some other thing. I think a lot of the industry concern around him has been whether he can recruit. And I don't know if you've heard the same sentiment, but every time I talk to somebody and I'm like, so what's the deal with him? And they're like, well, we'll see if he can recruit at this level. Because I think a lot of his guys were older transfers that he got. And transferring into Vanderbilt is hard. And he just got a lot of multi-year transfers. So we'll see. But that's kind of my brief synopsis. I'll go off of what you say as well, because I think I, we could probably build off each other a little bit here. Well, look, you would you would better have somebody doing your diligence. NATO mm-hmm. style on, on the back end with transfers. And I would, I would presume he's smart enough to do that. Um, I, I don't think we ever had any evidence that, that stack put in the work there. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, look at the, look at the evidence. And when he got good transfers, they left or right. they were highly regarded and didn't pan out. There was two guys that were effective transfers to them. It was Mignon and Robbins and both those guys kind of, Robbins fell into their lap because of the medical stuff, and Monyo just really wanted to be there and fit what they wanted to do. Yeah, look, if, if you can go get a couple guys every year that you get into grad school and scout those guys out ahead of time the way Oates has done it, um, if you can identify some good up-and-coming guys, I mean, the, the junior-senior status is where they've got the hole because you can only transfer in 60 hours. So unless you do the Ezra Magnone, and just say, forget it, I'll give up a bunch of hours because I want to come play here, you're not going to get that guy. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think it's that and, and finding high school fids that, kids that fit. But again, when I, when I looked at the roster continuity piece and experience, that's something that does give me a little bit of hope there. I mean, maybe not a little bit. might might be might be mm-hmm. a lot. So Yeah. And another thing, too, uh, Rex Rowe tweeted this, and this was kind of his headline quote. Uh, he works as hard as anybody I've been around. Bobby Kremen says of Mark Byington, his longtime assistant at College of Charleston. I think a lot of recruiting is one having ties in the area, which you've mentioned yes. that he probably does have, and two just working at it. You got to nail the evals, but if you have those, those two things, you could be a good recruiter at the level. And there's obviously yeah. a concern expressed about that from people, but I think if you work at it and you have connections, I think you can get a lot of guys that Vanderbilt hasn't been able to get. I mean, they they just left so many stones unturned. I mean, you you really don't have any idea. The, the transfer portal is going to be tough for them, but you don't have any idea if there's anybody that can find a sweet spot with that because there's never been anybody here during that time mm-hmm. that's been able to try it or that was willing to try it. it. The last guy just wasn't. So, Yeah, I think the NIL piece could be something too. I think he understands that. James Madison seemed yeah. to really – really have an uptick in that. And maybe that's just outside perception. I don't know what their NIL actually looked like. But based on the transfers they were able to get, it seemed like they had some semblance of that. And you would think that in the interview process and such that he would have kind of picked their brains on that and maybe been confident in their ability. And if they were that close on Dusty May, maybe they told him something along the lines of NIL as well that was appealing to him. Well, you know why Clark Lee is getting help in NIL? It's because people like him. You got a lot of boosters that are local. Some of those are friendships, that kind of thing. But he was able to sell people to donate to a cause because they like the guy they're giving to. Stack Stack didn't get that for the most part. He had it from a couple people, but it wasn't coming from from some of the guys that, that would do it for a guy that they'd like. And see, I think that's the thing. 
if, if you're sitting in a room and you Candace Lee and you're talking to him, you got to be thinking, all right, can, can I sell this guy to our big NL guys? And if I can, then we got a shot at doing a lot of things we couldn't do with the last guy. Yeah, I totally agree. I think they've got to be able to market this program, not only to the fan base, but to the booster base. And I think there's a chance that they can do it with this guy. Like there's, I haven't spoken to anybody who doesn't like him yet. And I haven't talked yeah. to that many people, but if he could be anywhere near as liked within the pe- the money and the people that matter as Clark Lee is, you got a chance. Boy, here's a good one. Uh, View Matt 23, what are fair expectations for Mark Byington? Um, man, Vanderbilt is, is for all the reasons we've outlined, is, is, a, is a tough job mm-hmm. in the transfer portal standalone because of those limitations. Mm-hmm. Number two, the program's been in a ditch for the better part of 10 years, so there's that. Mm-hmm. Um, number three, you're swimming with sharks with the coaches in this league. Nate Oates, Bruce Pearl, Rick Barnes. I mean, you know, they're not. A, there's not a bad coach in this league at the moment. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say if you can slip into the NCAA tournament within three to four years, that's a starting point. Mm-hmm. And I, I think if a guy can get there three out of every five years on average, and I give him maybe a little bit of a pass for the first five because where they are. Does that seem in the ballpark? That's generally what I would think. I think short term this year, you want to see that they have a direction. I think four or five league wins is probably what you're looking at here. Like they're going to have so much roster turnover. It's tough to. I don't know, man. Stack here. Stack won. Did he win three or four? He won four. I don't know. If Stack won four last year, he, he might he be won. able to fall backwards into four. Yeah, I mean, uh, not terribly. but but the pro- but the program's in a bad place. I mean, there's not going to be a lot left mm-hmm. on the roster when he gets here. So there is that. Yeah, I just think you need to more the, more so than the win total. You need to have a direction, and you need to see like either they're getting better throughout the year, or they're buying into the vision, or something along those lines. And I think that's a successful year one. You look at Notre Dame; they won what seven league games, and everybody was thrilled because of it in year yeah. one. Because he's got a team full of young guys that were defending. They seem to believe in what he's saying. None of them went in the portal. If that's the year one that they have, I think you're thrilled about it. Yeah. Admiral VU, uh, way too early predictions. You knew from the jump that Coach Jerry Stackhouse wasn't going to work out. What's your gut feeling on buying his tenure? I I think he's got a shot um, based on people. I I talk to people who are like, Vandy screwed it up because they always do, and they could have done this or that. And, and, And again, that's, that's not really relevant to Mark Byington in this. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the people that I talk to that know more about him think that there's a, a path for him, that, that you can explain how it could work. I, I never could with Jerry Stackhouse mm-hmm. other than just, um, you know, throwing fairy dust at everything and going, well, he's Jerry Stackhouse and people know him and know the name and he runs great sets um, and, mm-hmm. and maybe it'll all come to get. That was, that was always – a wish and a prayer. I, I don't think this is a wish and a prayer high. It might not work out, but I, I can't fault him for looking at this and saying, you can't find the obvious stuff with this one that was there with Stack, that you just knew from week one based on what you were hearing. This is never going to work. I'm not hearing that kind of stuff. Yeah, I I would tend to agree. I mean, it's, we, we haven't even got to week one yet, so we'll see. But it doesn't look terrible from the outside. It looks like kind of the blueprint of what I thought they would get. And I think that's a fine thing to have. I don't know that he's going to be able to swim with the Sharks early on, or I don't know how how much he's willing to kind of be in those circles, get his hands dirty a little bit. But you would think that he'd be able to take this program to where it's at least relevant in some sense. And I think that's a real step for them. And I have no reason to believe that they're going to be as bad as they were again this year. Yeah. It will just be nice – not to just dread basketball season. Oh, that'd be awesome, Chris. I love basketball, but I was more <laughs> happy to go to Belmont and Lipscomb all year. Like, by I tried a lot. to warn you. <laughs> you did. I had a fun first year. Right. <laughs> that was as good as it ever got. Trust me. Um, oh, okay, yeah. The Wars is buying to develop guys who've been successful in the portal. I was 
reading at very experienced teams. I think we just covered that, but if you've got something to add there, go for it. I mean, I think the development of, was it Edwards? I think it's something that you really look at. Let me see. I had his stats up somewhere. First year was five points, then nine, then 13, then 17. So that tells you pretty good things about their development. They have guys who have stayed, and then he's kind of supplemented it with veterans, which I think is the blueprint you really need. So I think ideally it's a mix of both, but we'll see what that looks like at a bigger, tougher job. Uh, wonders, wonders, how's Byington's golf game? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I hope we never find out. Uh, uh, boy, there were some stories there. If I see him at one of the courses, I'll let you know. But, hey, Chris, I can't throw stones. I did golf in the middle of an SEC tournament yeah, game. Yeah, well, I don't pay you what Vanderbilt paid stack. So That's um, true, yeah. Um, NBA door, why is he the best choice for Vanderbilt? I'm, I'm not sure that I can tell you he's the best choice for Vanderbilt. I can tell you why he might be a right choice. And, and I, I just want to – with him, would you just want to – when they make a hire – not be able to spot that this is awful right away. And and I don't I don't I don't see <laughs> that, that with standard? this one. <sighs> Feels like the standard yeah. I've been living in for about a decade, to be honest with you. Yeah, I don't I don't think it's that. I don't I don't think it's the best hire they could have made, but I think it's a hire that you look at with some optimism. And that's kind of where I'm at. I would say B as well. And maybe if you're looking at it as the best hire, it's kind of that he fits what they want to do. And I think he gets where this program is and has done wonders with programs in this similar state before. Maybe that's what they were looking at. But And maybe he gets the mix of NIL and um, Portal and high school guys. But I don't know that he was the best hire. I think there was better names on the board. But it was the one that they liked, and I guess that's what they did. Yeah. NBA door, who actually made the call on Byington. From what I have been told, I, I, there was mixed stuff out there before we – started the search um that i heard it was dear Myers search i i don't really have any evidence that he was involved probably until the end what the way it usually goes is the athletic director puts together a committee leads a search recommends a candidate to the chancellor so ultimately the, the way it probably went i don't know they sit in a room and say hey here's here's the guy we like what do you think and he gives you a thumbs up or a thumbs down I don't have specific information. That's how it went down, but I would bet you that's it or pretty close. Yeah, I would. I don't have as much of an idea as you would have on that, but uh, that seems to be kind of the formula that you would think in a scenario like this. The the other questions are. Oh, Trevor. Uh, yeah, you saw that. <laughs> um, I mean. Uh, how will things be different than under stack? I think we sort of hit around that. Will you be able to get a search post-mortem? I already kind of have, and I outlined some of that. There's some parts I've got to keep to me for now. Uh, let's see if there's anything else. <laughs> um, I think... Oh, here's a good one. NBA door. Besides obviously winning, what can the new coach do to drive sidewalk slash long-term fan engagement that won't rub Vandy the wrong way for some of the way your posts about the AD want to low-key coach? Chris, you want a, you want a great answer out of me? Sure. You come on the Vandy Sports Podcast every week. I, yeah, I mean, that might be a lot. Just just try, man. It, it's not It's not hard to – just show up and do your – 80% of life is just showing up and doing your job, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, the people that are special are are the ones that go above and beyond and that other 20% and figure out how to do that better than other people more creatively. We, we didn't get to 80% with the last guy. I mean, I, I don't know where we got. It might have been 40 or 50. I, I don't know that it was a lot more than that. And and part of that is just, just be nice to people. Um. Don't don't feel like everything's about you and your image. Um, the, the people that generally feel secure are the people who are doing their job. You're going to get crit criticized for stuff at times, whether you're doing your job or not. Um, I don't know. I, I I think Stack knew in the back of his head that the critics were right, right about a lot of stuff, and I think that's why it hit him so hard and he was so prickly about it. Just, just show, up, show up and do the stuff you're supposed to do 
treat people well, work hard, and and create a good culture and, and play to your strengths. I think if if Mark Byington does that, he's got a chance. Yeah, I mean, if you, if you can see he's got a vision and he cares and he's putting the effort in, I think this isn't a, that hard of a fan base to please. The expectations haven't been that high in the past, and yeah. they've certainly had worse. So, I mean, just come in and show you care and see if see if you can develop an identity in this program. And I think people would buy into that if you do. I mean, people like Clark Lee, and he went two and ten, so it's not that not that hard to please these guys. Ingold asked me for a salary guess. Um, based on some stuff I've heard, I would I would say maybe two and a half mil, but I I'm not I'm not at all um, comfortable with giving you that as the definitive answer. I'll, I'll probably find out more. It, what what will happen is somebody will tweet it out. Somebody that's connected in the agent and the coaching world, and if it's a if it's a good salary, you'll hear it probably from somebody else. Um, Vanderbilt's private, and you can never get that till what a couple years after the fact. So, yeah. Um, if Mack isn't hired anywhere, would he really be willing to be an assistant coach on the new guy? I don't. I don't see why Chris Mack would do that. Yeah, not that he's like of the mentality he's too good for that, but he might be too good for that but I do think uh Byington put a decent staff together people seem to like him and he seems de- at least decently well connected maybe not as well connected as Mac is but you would think that there's some kind of staff that he could put together you'd be happy with and if there if the one name that we've heard is on staff next year I think that's already probably a better staff than they had in the past and I like the guys that were on the staff last year yeah. but all right, we've done almost an hour. Any any parting thoughts on the hire of Mark Byington? No, we'll uh, we'll have wall to wall. I don't know if we're going to do something tonight. Maybe Billy and I will hop on and talk uh, ad nauseum again. But I think it's an exciting time in Vanderbilt basketball. Maybe it's not the hire that gets everybody completely fired up, but this program has a new voice. It's got a new direction, and I think it's got hope more so than it's had in a long time. Maybe since that late season run, but I feel like for the first time in a while you look at this and say, hey, maybe this could be a long-term fix here. And I think Vanderbilt's got a real chance to turn this thing. Maybe it's not going to happen immediately, but you've got a chance, Chris. And we haven't been able to say that a whole lot in the last couple months. All right. Uh, that's a wrap here. We'll have more coverage on Vanderbilt Tire Mark Byington. We'll be at the press conference whenever that is. For Joey Dwyer, I'm Chris Lee. This is Vin, this has been the Vandy Sports Podcast, uh, presented by our friends, the Wash House, the Murfreesboro Pure Milk Studio, Anchor Impact, Sutherland and Belk, and the Maynard Nexus Government Contracts Group. Thanks for watching and listening. We'll see you again soon.